We want to continue our series tonight. And uh, let's look at one verse here. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. If you're there, say amen. Awesome. Look at verse 27. The Bible says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Can we pray? Father, we love you and thank you that your word is so true, but thank you that we can stand fast on your word. Thank you that your word does not return void. Thank you that you are unchangeable. You are uh, you are God alone, but you said that uh, you change not. And uh, Lord, you are not, uh, you are unshakable. And uh, Lord, uh, many scoffers, uh, many deceivers, many uh, agnostics, many uh, uh, just grievous wolves have come. And they've tried to destroy your word. But I'm reminded in Psalms that your word is sure and it is steadfast that your word is forever settled in the heavens. So, Lord, I'm reminded that one thing that we have in our life that is sure, uh, Lord, our families are not sure, our homes are not sure, nothing about our lives are sure, even the lifespan of us are not sure, but one thing that is sure is your word. Your word is forever settled. And so we are reminded that God, through this teaching, that we're not striving together to build our own kingdom. We're not striving together, Father, uh, to do our own thing. We're striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so, Lord, we need your strength. We need your direction. We need your wisdom. Lord, we need your power to do it. So, God, we pray that as we yield to you, as we yield to the Spirit of Christ in us, that it will be just that, and we will live out your life. God, I pray that you will do a great work in us, that we may do a powerful work out of us and through us to reach our community and the surrounding world. God, we love you. We thank you for your word tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. On the screen, we covered this, and I'm just going to quickly review. There's been a great spiritual conflict, obviously, uh, taking place right now on this earth. And that conflict is between uh, the church and the body of the Christ. And it's between, I should say, the church, the body of Christ, and the armies of Satan. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, give this. We read that last week. And uh, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Make it no mistake, and uh, hear me out, that Satan has a hierarchy in place. He has a level of authority in place. Uh, you, if you think it's just Satan, you've got, uh, you, you've got it wrong. Uh, Satan has a very uh, high level of authority of demonic warfare and spiritual warfare. And, and he's able to beckon and call just like we have a governmental system in place and each branch representing different authority. Satan has the same thing in place. And, and we wrestle against that. And, and uh, Paul refers to Satan as our adversary. He said in 1 Timothy 5, 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give more, none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. I want you to know that there is being a reproach brought against the family. That's why we've got to strive together uh, to protect the family, to protect the faith, to protect the future. Paul says, for some are already turned aside after Satan. And Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan wants to devour the church, he wants to devour the Christian, and he wants to desire, uh, devour everything that you and I believe in and stand for. Let me explain to you what the battle is over on the screen. We as believers have been entrusted and been given a very uh, a, a precious thing committed to our trust, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You'll have to forward uh, 
fast a little bit. Sorry, I didn't give you the first two blanks or two slides, but that's okay. Uh, that was a quote from uh, George Whitfield and Jude, uh, the book of Jude. But if you could, slide forward. It is the gospel. Go ahead and bring one more. There we go. Now you're up to speed with me. First Thessalonians 2, 4 says, But as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Hey, listen, we've been entrusted with something precious, church, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do not ever tire or grow weary or grow faint in giving out the gospel. Don't ever think that it's lost its power. Don't ever think that it's lost its effect. Hey, listen, the power of God is still able to save. And you and I have to give that message out. We've been commissioned to go on the screen, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Make no mistake about it, church. Satan wants to hinder and fight everything that you and I do. He wants to blind the minds of them which believe not. He wants to hinder the gospel. He doesn't want you to go and knock on doors. He doesn't want you to go and invite people to the Easter drama and program that we have on April 8th. On April 8th, we have a musical a drama presentation along with the gospel being preached. And the title of what I'm giving on that Sunday is um, The Resurrection of Jesus Christ. What does that mean to me? Really, that's the question, is it, to the world? So what? So what you make those claims? So what the Bible says that? What does that mean to me? See, we know what it means to us, amen? We know as, as saved uh, believers in Jesus Christ, we know as the body of Christ what it means. But the lost world is sitting out there going, so what? What does it mean to me? We're going to answer that that day. We're going to answer and give them, uh, as the Bible says, an answer to every man of the hope that lieth within us. We're going to give the world an answer on April the 8th. And we're going to give an answer to the world all through 2012 and striving together to make sure that the gospel is not hindered. That Satan it, 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 that isn't squelching the gospel to go out. And that's what Philippians 1.27 reminds us to do. Paul says, only let your conversation be as it becometh. Look at that, the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Up on the screen, we learn that striving together literally means to wrestle in company with, means to labor with, or seek jointly. Church, we've got to do it together. We're on a team. Most of the time, uh, you talk about people wrestling, uh, uh, they're wrestling each other. Listen, we need to wrestle together, not each other. Okay, the battle's not with us. Okay, it's against Satan. He's our adversary. You are not my adversary. You are not my enemy. Okay, and a lot of times we get that uh, misplaced. And so many believers bicker and fight and fuss amongst themselves. There's so much bitterness within the church. The world looks at that and goes, no, thank you. And you know what? I can't really blame them. When we don't labor and strive together, we labor and strive against each other. Paul says, strive together with one mind, with one spirit, striving together for a purpose. What's the purpose? For the faith of the gospel. And uh, church, this is really our job description. It's a job description of our staff, our leaders. It's the job description of this church as members. This is our mission. What is it? It's togetherness. That's our mission. It's togetherness. Got to bring that up. One more click. Boom. There you go. It's togetherness. That's our job. But how can we strive together? Last week, how can we get the job done? Last week we talked about it. And that is by living a life that is consistent with the gospel. By living a life that is consistent with the gospel. Look at verse 27. He says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Only let. There's no other provision here. There's no other way to live. There's no other excuse to live any other life. Paul says only. Just this one. Just this way. 
just this life. Just this life. Make sure it's consistent with the gospel. So when the Bible uses the word conversation on the screen, it is referring to how you live your life on a daily basis. In other words, do you or I behave or act like Christ on a daily basis? Notice again in verse 27, he uses the phrase becometh of the gospel. When the Bible uses the word becometh, it gives the idea of one who lives appropriately after a godly sort or lives worthily or it can mean to accomplish something. Now stay with me, I'm going somewhere. In other words, our lives should make the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ look attractive to others. Does it look attractive or does it bring reproach? Does it look attractive or distasteful to the world? The gospel of Christ is beautiful, but do we accentuate its beauty? Do we accentuate that? You know that song, The Old Rugged Cross? Has a, a beautiful attraction to me. There's beauty in the old rugged cross. There's beauty in that cross that the Roman guards took pride in, that they were professional, uh, 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 they were professional uh, killers. They were, this is what they did, and this is how they made their living. They took pride, they made games out of it. They usually would take uh, the thieves of those days or the uh, uh, crooks of society and they would torture them in different ways to see how long they could last. And until they grew tires of them or tires of them and, and, and just were not amused of all the abuse, then they would stick the sword in their side to go ahead and end their life. They would do different things and do different methods that I'm not going to go into tonight. But they would do different things in different ways uh, to see how long or how much uh, the body could endure. This was a game to them. They enjoyed watching this. The crowds would come. and The crowds would watch this. It was like a Hollywood show. And they would come and watch the entertainment, so to speak. But the Bible says that Jesus was bruised for our iniquity. He was chastised for us. The Bible says that He was beaten to the point of not even being able to be recognized. That's my Savior. That's my king. And yet it's beautiful. The world looks at that and makes a mockery of it. The Bible says the preaching of the cross is foolishness. It's ridiculous. It's moronic. Does it make sense? But the Bible goes on to say, But to unto us that are saved, it's the power of the gospel. See, the truth is, on the screen, is your life or mine? If your life or mine is becoming to the gospel, it means that people are drawn to the gospel by the way you and I live or conduct ourselves. Our lives should be drawing people to the gospel. Titus 2.10, not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all Things. Leave that up on the, ver on the screen. Let me give you some definitions. The words not prolonging or purloining, excuse me, means not hold back or keep to oneself. Ever kept the gospel to yourself? Ever not told that person that the Spirit of God told you to go tell about His good news and you're like, hey, they don't want to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, did the Spirit ever tell you when you had that gospel track in your truck or in your car and you had one on you and you failed to go back into the store when the Holy Spirit prompted you, although you got your groceries, although you got to get them home because the, the ice cream is thawing out, the strawberries are going to get mushy, 
And the Spirit of God told you, go back inside and give the gospel track to that clerk, to that man, to that woman. And you got in your car and left. I've done it. You know what? I'm holding it back. I'm keeping the gospel to myself. Paul says, not purloining. Don't keep it to yourself. But showing all good fidelity that they may adorn. That word adorn means to decorate. means to trim. Do you make the gospel beautiful? Does it look pretty to others? Is it, is, is it adorning? Does it adorn your lifestyle? The doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. Our lives should be adorning, beautifying the doctrine of God. Our Savior in all things. Colossians 1.10 on the screen. That you might walk worthy of our Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. If the gospel is going to advance forward, folks, this year, it will take believers, it will take this church, who lives lives that are consistent with the gospel. It will take people who say they're Christ-like and actually act like it. That's what it will take. Hypocrisy has to go. It's time to quit faking it. It's time to quit playing church. It's time to quit just having these things just for us and start having the mindset, you know what, I'm going to strive together for the faith of the gospel. Every person that I see, I'm going to treat as a lost person until they tell me they're saved. Hey, well, what harm is it going to be if they just go ahead and tell you, hey, that's okay, I know Jesus. Hey, that's okay, I don't want to hear about your God. Hey, that's okay, I go to church. Hey, what harm is it going to take for you just to spend 30 seconds and say, do you know Jesus? And give them the gospel track. It's been a long time since we had to order tracks around here. That's a detriment to any church. I think if anything should be worn out, if the budget should be broken, it should be on tracks. Isn't that a thought? See, Pastor, that's pretty simple. It isn't to me when I walk by it. We print more stuff and junk around here than any church I know. Some of you don't even like the handouts that I give. But I don't give them because I have nothing to do. I give them to help you grow. You know what? It's just like that gospel track. If you don't want it, don't pick it up. But we don't do those things just to have nothing to do. We do all that we do for a purpose, and that's to strive together for the faith of the gospel. Folks, we're not just sitting here twiddling our thumbs. I don't sit here Monday through Friday, Saturday. We don't put in 70, 80, 90 hours a week just to, just to do nothing. See, all that you see is on what happens on Sundays and Wednesdays. But I want you to know there's a lot of stuff that happens Monday through Friday. There's a lot of stuff that goes on during the week that you know nothing of. But let me tell you something. What you see is just kind of the cream of the crop. It's just the icing on the cake. But it takes a lot of work to do this. I want to tell you, we strive all week long to give the gospel. I need you to get on board and help us. They were preacher. I didn't pull my time. Well, all I can say is I'm glad all of us don't feel that way. Because if all of us feel that way, guess what? It doesn't get done. You can't say, well, preacher, I pulled my time. It's time for them young people to do it. And it sure is. Young people, sit up now. Sit up like you really appreciate it. All right? And that you're really into it. Now, here's the deal. We can't just shuck it to the young people. And say, well, it's their turn. Well, who's going to train them? Who's going to teach them? Who's going to tell them? Maybe it'd be better instead of you just sitting there thinking that it's their job. Won't you take them on a Monday night? Won't you take them on a Saturday on the bus route and say, hey, show me where them boys and girls live. I'll go out with you and I'll drive you around and we'll invite people to church. They can't drive themselves. How are they going to get to church? If all of us take the attitude, well, it's someone else's job, you know what? Then we are not fulfilling what God has called us to do. We're not striving together. We're striving against each other. We're making it easy for Satan. We can't live that way. We can't think that way. 
And, in, and on the screen, you know what the biggest challenge is in advancing the gospel? It is people who say they are Christians, but then they don't behave like it. It'd be like a football player coming up to me and say, Hey, uh, preacher, I play football. Well, who you play for? I ain't got a team. But I got a helmet. I got some shoulder pads. I got thigh pads. I got knee pads. Man, I got, I got a football, too. I got the best cleats that your money can buy. Well, who do you play for? I don't have a team. Well, who do you play with? I go out in the backyard and toss it to myself. You know what we do with the gospel? We toss it to ourselves. We're not purloining. You know, not keeping it to ourselves. That's exactly what we're doing. We're just hoarding it. This is my gospel. This is what God gave me. God gave it to you so you'd give it away. And that's something God gave you something to give away. You know, and it's a thing that you can give away that you actually never run out of. You know, if you give money away, you know what's going to happen? You're going to run out of it. Right? You're not, you will not run out of God's grace. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. It's one thing you won't get, get, get uh, run out of. Say, well, what, what should we be doing? And I shared with the, this with you in October of 2011. Uh, just three things. Uh, we, we have three things, really, I, I believe that we should follow into and that we should really commit to do. And one of them is this. this we have a role, and it's to be salt and light. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Hold your bookmark in Philippians 1. But go to Matthew chapter 5. Would you look at that? We, we have a role. And our role is to be salt and light. Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. Now I'm going to wait for you to get there because all of you need to see it. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Hey, let's do a little less talking and a little bit more doing. How about be, let's be a church of doers? Not just pew sitters, sponges, soaking it all up. Let's take what we learn and let's go actually apply it to our lives and then go share that with others. Hey, let's be doers this year. You know what's striving together for the faith of the gospel? That's people who are doers. That's people who don't sit around and wait for it to get done. They make sure it gets done because they, they get up and do it. Matthew 5, 13. Look at it. Ye are the salt of the earth. Did you see that? Hey, let's read that statement together. Ready? Begin. Ye are the salt of the earth. Who's the ye? No, just go ahead and say me. Who's the ye? That's right, it's you. Yeah, make it personal. We always like to say it's you. It's us. No, it's me. It's me. You know, regardless of whether you go out and do it, Miss Boots, I'm still the salt of the earth. If you lose your Savior, guess what? That don't change who I am. I'm still the salt of the earth. Look at it. The Bible says, But if the salt hath lost its Savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for what? Nothing. Zero. Nada. Zilch. But to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. Let's say it together. Ready? Ye are the light of the world. Who's the ye? Me. Yeah, don't say you. Let's make it personal. Who's the ye, church? It's Me. It sure is. He says, ye are the light of the world. Verse 14. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Then you tell me why the church is so silent today. Forget about them churches you see on TV that have tens and thousands of people on it. I have a reason why that happens. And not all of them are not godly. Okay? 
but most of them are. Most of them don't stay to this true word of God. Okay? It's showtime for the sheep is what a lot of it is. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. The other day, our house lost power for no reason at all. We love that. It lost power on a Friday and didn't come back up to about Saturday around noon. We love that. But you know what we did? We got out our candles. Got them big old candles, you know. I don't know what we did with our oil lamps. I don't even, I, I, Melissa says we didn't pack them when we moved here. Uh, they're somewhere. They're still packed up somewhere. Um, you can have them when the rapture happens, all right? You can have them. But the truth of the matter is we got those candles out, and um, we lit those things up. And I don't know, we probably had about eight or ten. It was like, it, uh, it was like a forest fire in there. And we, we lit those up. And you know what? That room lit up as if we had the light switch on. And then I started taking light, those candles and I started placing them around uh, the house so we get go, go, go around the house. Because, you know, you never have to go potty until the lights go out. You ever notice that? <laughs> you never have to go until the power's out. Then everybody has to go. All five of us. We're about to bust the gut. Got to go. And you know you only get one flush, right? Amen? So, you know, so I'm spreading out the candles and I'm like, all right, let's just be diligent here. You know, we got to tough this out. And so we're calling, um, uh, who, who's our lighting? Uh, a, APE or AEP? Yeah. It is AEP, isn't it? Huh? Did I say APE? It's APE. Anyway, those nice people who provide us power. And uh, so I started spreading. And you know what I noticed? Every room, as dark as it was when I took that candle in there, lit it up. And it lit it up well enough that I could see. And get the mindset here. We think that we are no effect. We think that we're only just a light. We're not just a light, folks. We're a light that's set up on a hill that all the world can see. And as dark as the world is, imagine how bright we can be. Say, well, what good will one light do? You tell me how good one light of Jesus did on the earth. How, how well and good was that light? You know, the Bible says in Jude, Jude 22, and some having compassion, making a difference. You know, the Bible says, and some having compassion. Not in all, but in some. I want to be part of the some. I don't know who the some are, but I want to be a part of that some making a difference. I want to be a light set up on a hill. I don't want to take my light and hide on a bushel. I didn't take those candles that night and go, you know what? That's just too bright in here. Let's put a pillow on it. Let's put a hat on it. Let's cover it up. I didn't do that. Why? I wanted to see where I was going. I wanted to see and not stomp my toe. I wanted to be able to see where I was going. I couldn't see without the light. Our role is to be salt and light. Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify you. No, glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know the light isn't for you. You ever thought about that? It's not even your light. <laughs> It's Christ's light, and He wants to show Himself through you to other people. Why? So they see you? No, so they see Him. 
so they may glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Isn't that incredible? Our role is to be salt and light. But secondly, our responsibility is to preach the gospel. Go to Mark chapter 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Mark chapter 16. You probably could quote this. I'm pretty sure you could. But let's all look at it together. It's so good. It's good for us to participate and be in our Bible. And we'll say it together when we all get there. I'll read it once because you're still getting there. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Are you there? Yes or no? All right. Let's all say it together. Ready? Begin. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, is every creature just in your neighborhood? No, but it's part of it, all right? Is every creature just uh, at where you work? No, but it's part of it. Is every creature uh, done uh, through our outreach and evangelism here at our church? No, but it's part of it. Is it done through the missions program that we have at our church? Yes, but it's just a part of it. Why do we do all that we do? Why? Because we're trying to strive together for the faith of the gospel and we realize that we have a responsibility and our responsibility is to preach the gospel to every creature. And I'll tell you when we can stop when every creature has heard the gospel. Say, when will that be? Have no idea, so we'll keep preaching. Have no idea. Look at Acts 26. Look at Acts 26. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. Acts 26. The easiest thing to do is just go to Romans and back up. Acts 26. Here's our responsibility. Acts 26, verse 18. I believe it's the commission for the church age today. I really do. I believe this is, hits the nail right on the head. I believe this is our direct mail. Look at it. Verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. That they may reco- uh, receive forgiveness. Excuse me. Receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them. Which are sanctified by faith that is in me. To open their eyes, to take the scales off where Satan has blinded them. We want to open their eyes and bring them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan, from his bondage unto the freedom and the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ and the Father. And that's what our responsibility is, is to make sure that we give the gospel out. But thirdly, we have a role, we have a responsibility. But the third thing is to reach beyond these walls. Look at Luke chapter 14. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Go to Luke 14. We got to think and be others minded. We can't just be uh, thinking of ourselves. We can't just be uh, doing ministries that are just for us and, and fellowships and all those things are nice. But let's be mindful that we've got to be reaching, we've got to be preaching. We've got a role to fill. We've got a responsibility to carry out. But then also, we need to reach out. Luke 14, 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house might be filled. That my house may be filled. You know, people, folks, I love our church. And I love being here. I love coming to church. But you know, I, very, I, I really realize, and it's clear as to me, and hopefully it is to you, that if we just sit here, we'll never reach the lost. We'll never reach the lost if we just camp out here. We can't just camp out here. We can't get comfortable here. After all, this building isn't for you. It's partly for you, but it's to bring in the lost that we might reach them for Jesus Christ. 
It's amazing to me the Bible says compel them to come. Have you been doing any compelling? Begging people to come to church. Now, I don't know how many people know that I'm a pastor here in town. I, I doubt less know than more know. But you know, I've never had anyone invite me to church yet. Say, well, you're a preacher. You know that. But the community doesn't know that. Say, well, you're on TV. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Just because they see me on TV doesn't mean they recognize me in public. Now, I've not had one person invite me to church. That's shocking. Say, say well, what does that mean to you? I'll tell you what it means just means that I believe the church has forgotten its role, maybe has forgotten its responsibility, and we've definitely stopped reaching. You know what the worst can happen? Is people tell you no. You know what the worst can happen? Is that they tell you, hey, I'm a part of so-and-so church. You know what I do? I go, great, stay connected, stay in there. Worst could happen, say, I'm not interested and some aren't. Say, well, what if we don't live this way? What's the big deal? Well, it's the testimony of our salvation that suffers. And it affects all those that we come in contact with. If you hoard the gospel, people don't hear. If you hoard the gospel, people don't get saved. And these last two statements I'll give you and we close. On the screen, when your actions match your beliefs, this is called integrity. But also on the screens, when your actions contradict your beliefs, it's called hypocrisy. When my actions match my beliefs, it's called integrity. It's called truthfulness. It's called faithfulness. But when my actions contradict my beliefs, oh, I say one thing, but I don't do it. Oh, I call myself a Christian, but I never tell anybody. I say I love God, but then I don't tell anyone how they can love God and know God. Oh, I come to church faithfully, but I never invite anyone else to come with me. You know what? That's called hypocrisy. Integrity doesn't mean perfection, but when we fail... Uh, 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 and our lives come up short of God's word, you know what we do? We readily admit it, our sins and failures, and we don't try to project this image that we are perfect. Why? Because it's repulsive to others when we do. It's amazing to me that many try to portray this. And I'm going to give you one last verse, last place you got to turn. Look at Romans chapter 2. And look at this. Romans chapter 2, verse 21. Romans 2, verse 21. When we act contrary to our beliefs, when our actions contradict our beliefs, it's hypocrisy. And Paul admonished Jewish believers here of this very thing in Romans 2. Look at verse 21. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Did you catch that? He says, Thou that preachest a man should not steal. Dost thou steal? Thou that saith a man should not commit adultery. Dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, abhor means to hate, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles 
through you as it is written. Pretty strong words here. Is the name of our great God and King blasphemed through you? Is it integrity or hypocrisy? Paul says you believe this or that and you project this certain image, but your life and actions don't match. You know what the lost world does? They are quick to pick up on that, aren't they? Don't you just love it when lost heathen people go, I thought you were a Christian. You know what? They're right. I am, and the best thing for me to do is to admit it to you. I was wrong, and I did not honor the Lord in the way I acted. I'm sorry. My actions don't portray how righteous He is. My actions don't portray how holy He is. I'm sorry. How much that would change the people that we come in contact with if we would just live our lives this way. Paul said that because of the hypocrisy, God's name was blasphemed among the Gentiles. In essence, We aren't going forward with the gospel. We're backing up, Paul said. Just like on a football team, the defense on the opposing football team backs up the offense. And this is what Satan desires to do and wants us to do. He wants us to back up. He wants us to become of none effect or influence in this world with the gospel. That's what he wants. Listen, church, we got to strive together for the faith of the gospel. we got to live our life and have our conversation only as it becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. we got to act and behave like our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's the only way to live. Our conversation, our manner, our lifestyle ought to make sure that the gospel is attractive to the world. They want it so bad that they beg us to tell them of a hope that lieth within us. I haven't had anybody to beg me lately for that. And they should. Has anybody begged you for the gospel lately? Well, we live in a different world, preacher. Really? Has sinners gotten more sinful? Have the lost got more lost? Has hell gotten hotter? My friend, there are still lost who are dying and spending eternity in hell without Jesus Christ. And the reason for that is because we are not striving together for the faith of the gospel. We're not telling them like we should. Charles Spurgeon said that if people were to die and go to hell, that they ought to have to jump over our bodies and they ought to be wrapped around our ankles we ought to be wrapped around their ankles I should say begging them and trying to spare them from an eternity in hell they ought to be jumping over our bodies to get there and we ought to be wrapped our hands and our arms around their ankles to keep them from going to hell do you get the picture say well physically I can't do that Well, I guess that would be a little bit weird if you were in Walmart hugged around someone's ankles. But you know what? I kind of wonder if they wouldn't get the picture a whole lot clearer if we would do something that drastic. If it mattered that much to me, would I do it? Isn't that the question? If hell was that hot and heaven was that sweet... What I would, would I do all that I could to keep people from going to heaven, hell and to gain heaven? Would I do that? Paul said in Philippians 1.27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. That whether I come or be absent or hear of your affairs, that you stand with one mind, one spirit, striving together For the faith of the gospel. Church, this year, let's do it together. 
We don't have time for any bickering. We don't have time for arguing. We don't have time for all that uh, 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 silly stuff. We don't have time for all that vain jangling. We don't have time for that tomfoolery. We don't have time. Why? Souls are perishing. We don't have time for all that. Hey, let's do something good. Let's do something right. Let's do something holy and godly. Let's strive together for the faith of the gospel. Father, we pray and ask that you will speak to our hearts individually. God, in just the